and I have so enjoyed learning about the uh, Phytochem Talk series. You have a great lineup, so I'm delighted to get to join. Um, as an intellectual historian, which is someone who's interested in how ideas move across time and space, today I'm going to contribute a uh, discussion of the historical side of things. So my talk today is on new worlds of drug discovery, path dependency in the early modern Atlantic pharmacopoeia. So in our time together, I'm gonna to talk about some of the problems and potentials for extracting information about natural products and living nature from historical documents. I'm going to start with the mystery of the day, a plant-based medicine called Tsoyoyaktik by the Nahuas, or the people who were commonly known as the Aztecs, rulers of Mexico before Tenochtitlan fell to Spanish invasion in 1519 to 1521. Uh, ethnobotanists think that this plant was either a Shoanokalan cultury, a bulbous neophyte that grows primarily in seasonally dry uh, tropical biomes, such as in eastern Mexico, or perhaps it is a tropical species of Veratrum, perhaps Veratrum frigidum. I think all of you will likely have uh, more informed hypotheses than mine, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how the, the uh, web of this knowledge was messily made. Um, uh, as this encounter was long before formalized Linnaean binomial nomenclature, um, what we have are indigenous descriptions of so their yaktic in action, some European indigenous codices that record a couple of its characteristics, and a long trail of 20th century ethnobotany that tried to make sense of this information. Talking about Tsoyoyaktik means talking about how we know what we know about indigenous American plant-based medicines from before and shortly after European colonization of Mexico. So while Tsoyoyaktik is the, the botanical center of this talk today, I'll also be following a case study of the 16th century physician, Dr. Francisco Hernandez, his study of Mesoamerican medicines and the plant-based medicines that he brought back to Europe with him. So we'll wade through descriptions of zoyoyaktik and how those trickled into the biological record. Finally, I'll wrap up with some comments about path dependency and the making of pharmacopoeia. Zoyoyaktik never became a global commodity, even as the Colombian exchange made tobacco and quinine and tomatoes popular in Europe. Why is that? And how do we know different things about plant-based medicines that first captured the interest of experimentalists in the early modern period during the time of the scientific revolution versus those that captured the attention of modern scientists? My final comment will be about my uh, new platform, the Global Pharmacopias Project, which my research group is developing. And I hope to leave you with a, a final tidbit of why that might be a useful resource for those interested in plants, medicines, and their history. So uh, this week started, of course, with Indigenous Peoples Day in the US or Columbus Day in some circles. And you'll probably already be primed for the chronology and the geography that I'm going to talk about today. Um, most of my research concerns the Spanish empire broadly defined from the 1490s to the early 17th century as Europeans and Americans became ever more entangled. This talk focuses primarily on plants used in central Mexico, here suggested in a habitat mapped by the, uh, the Kew Gardens. Big questions for me are, how did early moderns understand and intentionally influence the Colombian exchange, that widespread transfer of flora, fauna, commodities, culture, populations, technologies, medicines, and diseases between the so-called new world and the old world, starting in the late 15th century? How did these developments interact with increasingly ambitious efforts to mold society and to systematically tap the natural world? How did medicine and the invention of pharmacopoeia impact that history? In the early days of overseas trade, here suggested in the 1507 Waldsee Mueller map, Europeans one step removed from er merchant vessels often confused the East and West Indies. They presumed that they might find similar substances in one place and in the other. It was all the tropics after all. 
They often used the term new world to discuss the Americas, separating it from the so-called old world of Afro-Eurasia. By using the term new worlds in my title today, I play on the double evocation of geography of the Americas and the radical possibilities of invention launched with the American encounter. Early modern Europeans classified a vast array of substances as drugs, ranging, as Ben Breen has put it, from herbs and spices like nutmeg and cinnamon and chamomile to dangerous poisons like lead, mercury, and arsenic, um, as well as oil of rose or lavender, and even Egyptian mummy, literally ground up mumia from um, Egyptian coffers. The word drug then mostly meant medicinal herbs and spices, as well as dyes, but it shifted to describe intoxicatory substances only by the late 17th and early 18th centuries. To talk of early modern drug discovery then is to take seriously that drugs were what we call an actor's category for natural substances that colonists intentionally sought out and aimed to unveil from nature itself. When considering Spanish expansion, here suggested through a scene from the conquest of Mexico Tenochtitlan in the Florentine Codex, students learn to think about motivations. They recite that the conquistadors who rent new territories from indigenous hands had been motivated by the three Gs, gold, glory, and God. And to these three Gs, I would like to add a fourth central motivation, that is good health. Rumors of the fountain of youth proved so tempting to explorers like Ponce de Leon because their potential curative power fit into the most fundamental motivations for European expansion. Access to networks of trade that featured not only flavorful spices, but also medicines of fabled curative power. Europeans believed that nature was filled with medicines, just waiting to serve the rightful purpose of improving human life. For them, studying plants was not often an ends in itself, but rather a means of revealing yet more cures to better human life. That brings me to the earliest explicitly scientific expedition and the studies of plant-based medicines that came out of it. On January 11th, 1570, King Philip II of Spain, ruler of territories stretching from Italy to Peru, tasked the physician, Dr. Francisco Hernandez, was a very ambitious task. The king wrote that it is hereby ordered that you, Dr. Francisco Hernandez, our physician, shall hold and occupy the office of our chief medical officer of the Indies, islands and lands of the ocean sea. You are to be a, an expert in all things relevant to the history of natural things. Hernandez was to go to New Spain, now Mexico, immediately, because he was supposed to uh, um, go to first to the land that we hear of uh, more plants and herbs and medicinal seeds. They are to be found more there than anywhere else. When in Mexico, Hernandez was to consult, quote, all the doctors, medicine men, herbalists, Indians, and other persons with knowledge in such matters, and thus gather information about herbs and trees and medical plants. Hernandez was not supposed to just collect raw plants like a naturalist, however. Wherever he went, the king ordered him to find out how those medicaments are applied and what their uses are in practice, their powers, in what quantities they should be given, as well as the places in which they grow and their matter of cultivation, whether their habitat be dry or moist, or if they grow along trees or plants, or if they occur in different varieties. Hernandez was supposed to experience and test all of these substances firsthand. And finally, he was supposed to send back to Spain all of the medicines and herbs that um, he saw in such parts, provided that they are noteworthy in his judgment and do not already grow in these realms in Europe. After being in Mexico, Hernandez was supposed to go to Peru and do the same thing all over again. So Dr. Hernandez did as he was ordered after a fashion. He set out for New Spain in 1570, but became so engrossed in completing a new edition of Pliny's natural history and in treating indigenous people who fell victim to the Cocolitzli pandemic that 
he got a little sidetracked. He returned to Spain in the late 1570s, and by 1580, the king had ordered a Neapolitan apothecary, Nardo Antonio Recchi, to take Hernandez's works and make them into that intelligible herbal that he had wanted in the first place. So, an apothecary, not a physician, usurped Hernandez's research project. What was supposed to be published immediately was left in Hernandez's handwritten manuscript. And then it circulated in only small audiences across Mexico and the European court. In Hernandez's will, he left to the king these 16 volumes on plants and animals and paintings of the Americas. Um, and he also asked that his majesty um, uh, acknowledge how much work went into creating Hey, Mackenzie, we can't hear you. That they be compensated through his estate itself. It's, it's working now. Beautiful. Those papers that Hernandez left, as well as the physical collections of plant, animal, and mineral collections burned up in a fire in the next century. For the most part, the Spanish crown kept quiet about Hernandez's findings about medical plants. His work was only published by others, both in Latin America and in Europe, including members of Galileo's scientific society, the Academy of the Lynxide. We call these works, this whole corpus, the Mexican treasury, and it's depicted here. During his time based around Mexico City, Hernandez did consult with indigenous medical specialists, predominantly speakers of Nahuatl, the language of the Aztec Triple Alliance. And in so doing, Hernandez recorded in Castilian and alphabetic knowledge, uh, knowledge in Nahuatl, a lot of knowledge that had otherwise remained oral. In doing so, however, his interlocutors, his editors, and Hernandez himself often shoehorned Nahuatl cures into the pharmacopoeia a list of medicaments that was increasingly standardized and regulated in Europe and its empires. Still, as Paula DeVos has pointed out, Hernandez's corpus remains one of the few sources that helps us catch a glimpse of Mesoamerican medicine and Materia Medica, collections of substances used as medicines to treat disease. Ethnobotanists have produced reference works from these substances, and chemists have assayed the bioactivity for a limited number of these materials, and encyclopedic works have sought to list and describe each of the hundreds of substances and their potential uses. However, as DeVos puts it, quote, the studies of the chemical properties of a handful of Nahuatl Materia Medica do not give an adequate sense of the medical tradition's breadth and versatility, nor do their authors explain how or why those particular substances were selected out of the hundreds of possibilities. In what remains of our time, I'd like to give you a sense of the Mesoamerican contributions to the Atlantic Pharmacopoeia by way of Hernandez, the plants that captured scientific interest in both the edge, age of Galileo and the present. As Hernandez's prolific writing trickled into others' publications, he, um, uh, he collected and, and um, included these Nahua bits of information in European style natural histories and pharmacopoeia. Take, for example, this selection of Hernandez's Index of Native Remedies um, presented in the Spanish book by Juan Barrios in, published in Mexico in 1607. So there are all sorts of remedies in here. Uh, if you had eye blemishes, you were um, uh, encouraged to consume some ololiuki, the seeds of morning glory, glory known today to be particularly hallucinogenic. And you should mix those in with milk and with chile. When you can't stop crying, just use the liquor of mitzkit, the, the mesquite tree, or um, and include it in, with some water. If you had a patient who was very thirsty, the answer wasn't the obvious, give them water, but instead to take a particular rubber and include it in a maize-based beverage. For sleeping, Hernandez recommended 
a, a resin that could be snorted into the nostrils as a common rem remedy for cold. But together, I hope to focus on what to do to, fo um, if, to check if the ailing patient was going to make it or not. So Hernandez had learned to put the root of the shoyoyaktik by the nostrils. And if the sick person sneezed, it would be a sign of life, not death. Here in the slide shown, uh, Barrios Nahuatl has been quite mutilated. And the classical Nahuatl that Hernandez probably heard would have been better transliterated with Zs rather than Cicedias. But the same plant was mentioned in a whole slew of other remedies in Barrios and therefore likely in Hernandez too. You could use it to get rid of flies that, um, if you ground it in some honey and you included it in your house. And you could use it to make someone who was not on the precipice of death um, also make them sneeze. So what is this fabulous substance and uh, um, how was it passed uh, from one knowledge set to another? Zodiactic seems to have featured in some of Hernandez's more natural historical writings too. Exactly what his original notes said prove a little bit hard to piece together, but he elaborated on this substance, jockeying between remedies of natural history in the style of Pliny, naming each element of nature and in turn defining it. Whatever description existed in manuscript was concretized in this, the Academy of the Lingside publication of the Rerum Medicarum Novae Hispaniae Thesaurus. The 1651 edition held in the Getty Library includes some marginal annotations by someone more fluent in the Nahuatl than the authors themselves. And they note that the Zodiac could be rendered as Shokoyak, Shokoyatsin, or Hispanico Idiomate Apelat Lirio Silvestre. This hand modified the plant's ending to include both a basic noun form and the more honoric, honorific diminutive scene. Um, and this linked the term to an early binomial it, by which the, a similar plant seems to have been known in the Castilian language. In the Madrid edition, hold on a second. Here we go. Got the slide, yeah? Great. Um, in the Madrid edition of Hernandez, published in Spanish in 1790, the description goes like this when translated into English. Sozoyatic, or plant like a palm, has roots and leaves like the leek or the palm from which it takes its name. On its stem, it has long purple flowers or in calyxes. The root, crushed and applied to the nose, provokes sneezing incessantly and clears away mucus, so that Indian doctors call it tisit and use it to predict when one of their patients will die or recover. A dram of the same thing is said to provoke urine or cure dysentery. Um, and this likewise mentions that when mixed with meat, it could kill mice. And if one washed the head with such a, de a, a decoction, it would kill lice. This famous plant is sprinkled all over with honey to exterminate all insects that walk through the house, especially when they are so invasive and harmful in summer. They are attracted to the sweetness. Part medicine, part pest control. Finally, Hernandez concludes with some notes about how to prepare it and its humoral qualities. It is bitter and hot and dry in the fourth degree. Pills are made with the root and applied to the rectum. The root is good for the chest, it purges phlegmatic humors and revives those suffering from an excess of them. In Meshuacan, they call it seuke. It grows everywhere. So we can triangulate Hernandez's definition of zodiac with uh, contemporary accounts. Take, for example, its appearance in the Florentine Codex, the compendium of all things New Spanish created by Fray Bernardino de Sahagún at the Colegio de Tlatelolco. 
Sahagun was Hernandez's immediate contemporary and likely read iterations of his text and consulted with the very same experts. For the most part, the Florentine Codex is a tripartite language structure with Spanish in the left column, an alphabetic Nahuatl in the right column, and images using both naturalistic and glyph descriptions are clearly ordered throughout the whole text. But during this section on medicinal herbs, that structure breaks down, and that means some different meaning is being conveyed. Sahagun's Nahuatl as noted in the Anderson and Dibble translation, um, uh, describes the plant, Zoyoyaktik, as a little onion. Here we go. At first, uh, this is dropped in the nose. Its roots, its leaves and, and seeds are all ground together, only as a powder or in solution. A, a very little is dropped in the nose. If much is inhaled, if much is dropped in the nose, it causes bleeding and he specifies where it grows um, in the edge of a forest, clarifying that it was not potable. The Spanish text depicted here in the other column differs a little bit. Again, some knowledge is available to only Nahua speakers, indigenous Americans, and some only to the Spanish. The Spanish text describes it in terms Europeans would understand. It has a head like garlic underground. And rather than emphasizing what would happen if someone drinks it, it the Spanish text emphasizes the mountainous environment in which it grew. Even more than for Hernandez, Sahagún's manuscript didn't really circulate, which makes it a really good barometer for on-the-ground knowledge available to European scholars in New Spain. Some did read Hernandez, of course. The famous English botanist John Ray took up Hernandez's description in his monumental uh, botanical catalog, Historia Plantarum. And he took directly from Hernandez, describing this plant as a herb like a palm that would be given by Tisit or indigenous physicians. From here, you can see a bit of the complexity in the making of this knowledge. In an era of copy-paste compendia, scholars in the rising field of botany literally just copied and pasted Hernandez's words into their own publications. These texts became the authorities. Physical nature uh, then was alienated from them. However, just because Soyoyaktik was listed as a potentially useful medicine in so many authoritative natural studies does not mean it was not incorporated into a more conservative field of medicine. But nonetheless, European apothecaries did not think that the plant was easy enough to obtain. They didn't think it could be so useful as sassafras or quina or tobacco or chocolate, the off-traded items of the Colombian exchange. So, Zodiac simply didn't appear in ceramic vessels like this one in apothecary shops, despite its uses. For most Europeans in the medical establishment, Hernandez and his Nahua collaborators had produced too much knowledge about a place too far away. As far as I know at this point, but admittedly we're in the early days of this research, no one elaborated a taxonomic correlation for Zoyo uh, with, with which they were really um, uh, willing to stick until the late 19th or early 20th centuries. By 1975, Bernard Ortiz um, uh, Montellano collected botanical names and determined that Zoyoyaktik was um, a Schoenkalon colteri or a Veratrum frigidum, um, the latter being related to an American hellebore. Montellano wrote that veratrine is a mixture of uh, 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 savadine, and he expanded on the extent to which all of these related mixtures were irritating to mu mucous membranes. Um, he cited particular studies in which similar plants had been used as uh, to show toxic action against houseflies. Textbooks like Medical Botany chalk up these effects to the work of steroid alkaloids present in the Liliaceae family. Where does all this leave us? First, with a sense of historical contingency, I think. And second, with some methodological reflections on uh, what we can learn from 
plant-derived medicines as described in histories. As for historical contingency, Doyoyaktik never took off as a Mexican export, despite its myriad uses for um, diagnosis to pesticide. Like Artemisia Mexicana, it's Taoyak, um, which was widely used as a fever medicine among healers, there was a European equivalent. Perhaps that was this Lirio Silvestre mes mentioned in that scholarly handwriting in the Gettys version of the text. The result is that mainstream apothecaries didn't list Soyoyaktik as part of their must-have medicines, nor did it merit prohibition. It just disappeared from practical use in Atlantic networks, cloaked in obscure manuscripts, or employed only in local medicines. It was then rediscovered, but only with a surge of interest in discovering nature from indigenous perspectives, which characterized much of the commitment to global prospecting in the early 20th century. Since then, Mexican and international scholars alike have poured over its potential applications and sought to identify the mechanisms that made those long dead patients sneeze. Drugs in the Atlantic pharmacopoeia often follow those two paths. Early on, a few popular books sold the idea of a handful of American plants that could change global medicine. If a medicament appeared on that list, it was cultivated, acclimatized to Europe, and shipped overseas. If, like peyote or other psychedelics or tzoyaktik, it did not make it into that initial designation, it was stymied in what scholars have called the puzzle of distribution. That Hernandez delighted in the details and didn't manage to popularize his new Spanish findings sealed that fate, establishing a path dependency that shaped later scientific engagement with plants like Tsoyoyaktik. Um, going forward, I'm eager to think about ways to make the systematic study of plant-based medicines like Tsoyoyaktik easier for a more expansive community. Um, I'm currently working to develop a platform called Global Pharmacopias with my colleagues, Daniel Lord Spell and uh, Gabriele Pizzorno at Harvard. Our aim is to make it possible for experts and non-experts to trace medicaments like Tsoyoyaktik or like peyote and their inclusion in the European um, increasingly imperial pharmacopoeia tradition. Through global pharmacopoeias, we have collected thousands of historical sources listing natural products and pharmaceutical preparations used in past societies. The collection features assemblages of products found in apothecaries' inventories and similar lists of medicaments in use from Europe and European dominions and other regions from antiquity to 1850. The goal is to present this collection in a form that is accessible to medical researchers, to biochemists, and medical and pharmacy historians studying natural products, that is to say, medicinally powerful substances extracted from nature. I'm happy to talk about the, uh, the, the first round of the site uh, in the Q&A. It's going to launch before the new year, but there you'll be able to see both distinct pharmacopoeia, lists of medicaments that are both references, like Hernandez's, which represent ideal types of medicaments that one ought to have on hand, and uh, a functional pharmacopoeia, which represented existing apothecary stores or botanical collections, by which I mean what people actually did have on hand, regardless of what the authorities thought. But that's enough about historical plant-based medicines. Let's turn it over to the Q&A. Thanks, Mackenzie. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand and or put them in the chat. I can start with one if, uh, if you're still thinking about questions. One is, um, so you mentioned that the passing of the medical no medicinal knowledge was oral in Mesoamerican cultures. Yeah. And I wonder how, what sort of systems they use to ensure that the knowledge, the integrity of the knowledge through generations? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, 
as tech uh, knowledge was shared both orally and through manuscript to some extent. So um, there were a highly trained uh, scribal class that were accustomed to writing in what we would see as some version of a combination of glyphs and uh, glyphs with some, um, uh, some elements of pronunciation baked right into them. So that means that there were likely many more manuscripts that included something about how to treat ailments that, that were destroyed either by the Europeans or the Aztecs were actually very interested in controlling their own paper records. So they had a number of documentary purges before. Nonetheless, healers called tisi, they're, um, you know, the, the wielders of medical knowledge, would uh, train students and they would um, work, they would have a very highly regarded position within given communities. And they would essentially work with apprentices who would learn their craft, right? Um, so after studying with a particular tea seat, you would be able to then continue on in that pro uh, in that profession and be recognized even by censuses like the Matricula de Hueco Cinco as an expert in that profession. Um, that that community of tea seat, that community of, of indigenous healers lived on after Spanish col the colonization too. And is one of the, the spaces that we can see even in modern Mexico, um, where you can encounter other ideas of healing that are beyond this uh, European uh, pharmacopoeia tradition. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, William. So um, that was a terrific talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooley. Uh, it reminds me of, of um, the, the Lewis and Clark expedition where Thomas Jefferson directed um, Meriwether Lewis um, to be um, uh, the physician for the expedition and to seek out um, the traditional remedies. So what um, happened with um, Lewis's um, investigation of, of the traditional remedies of, of the indigenous um, peoples of North America. Oh, so it's such a, a rich comparison. Um, I think, again, this gets back to that, that uh, motivations for colonization question, right? Um, we think about uh, European expansion in the form of territory, right? And, and of course, that's what the Lewis and Clark expedition ultimately yielded too. But a lot of those initial extensions of European tendrils into other territories were motivated, um, whether uh, uh, honestly or uh, in part or uh, to some degree, by this desire to learn about local medicines that they could cultivate both in those spaces or bring back to Europe in the form of seeds that could be cultivated elsewhere. So I'm not a Lewis and Clark scholar, but I think that your the the comparison that you're drawing is is um, would be kind of ripe for study. Many of those same questions um, motivated a lot of subsequent colonial enterprises. The trick with the Hernandez material is that it's so early, right? This is one of the earliest moments in which the Spanish government is intentionally, right, in the, the language that I provided you with at the beginning of the talk, setting out a, um, an expansionist project in explicitly medical and botanical terms. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question about the role of that the healers play and I never thought of healers perhaps as being some of the first experimentalists mm -hmm. uh, trying with drugs. And so what is the record saying in terms of uh, their role in coming up with new uh, bioactive plants and so on? And were they allowed to experiment even at the risk of, you know, uh, killing some of the people that they were trying to, to heal? Absolutely. So, um, I am not sure about the ethics of experimentation, and I don't know to what extent we have, we're able to access that information through the ethno history. Um, but what I can say is one of the things that uh, that is, so again, most of the, the, the information that we have about this period, when it's been written down, is written through Europeans, but with secret indigenous elements, right? In alphabetic Nahuatl, that is only today being studied extensively, which is very exciting. Um, uh, 
And what you find in that alphabetic Nahuatl is an emphasis on the first person actions of experimentation. I eat the plant, I drink the plant, I touch the plant, I sweat, I bleed, I sneeze. And again, it's all in first person. Now, as historians, we can interpret that in one of two ways. We can say, oh my goodness, this is someone who is doing all these things. You know, he's having so you can he's 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 sneezing. Um, or we could also think about this as as a, is this perhaps a grammatical guide about how someone should engage with these verb forms? And maybe it, we shouldn't interpret that first person action at all. So um, I think that that remains quite mysterious. But what I will say is that the Tisits were really highly regarded in their community. These are the people who you would go to uh, to with all of your different medical conditions. And they were not unlike sh shamans, highly prized members whose community would bring retributive action against them if things continually turned out badly, right? Or if they were taking advantage. What we do see Hernandez doing in his uh, experiences in Mexico is working with those healers when indigenous people started falling sick with smallpox and the Coco Leachley pandemic on which Johannes Krause has published a little bit recently and uh, correlating that to Salmonella and Terica. Thank you. Um, hello, this is Sarah speaking. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I just had a question regarding if there's any information as to how much of um, this traditional medication is still being used uh, now by indigenous nations in North America? And if so, if they are still being used in the same way or if um, the way they were adopted by Europe uh, or Europeans changed the way uh, indigenous nations actually use those medications? Yeah, absolutely. So the the tradition lives on, but of course is not as as vibrant as it likely would have been had there not been the arrival of Europeans. So um, I keep thinking back to this uh, statistics that I, I um, uh, recall that I think Gaurav had cited in in the the Nature's Metabolite Conference at Cornell about the. Um, 80% of the world population relying in some form of, of, of uh, a plant-based medicament or certainly medicament that would not be the equivalent of FDA approved, right? Um, I think that um, these, you could definitely buy these medical substances. You could, you could, uh, I haven't myself tried to, to um, buy this plant at a market in, in Mexico, but I think that you would likely be able to do that. Um, so, that's present within communities in the Huasteca. It's still used. This this language is still used in in um, modern Nahuatl, and those uh, indigenous languages are replete with specific identifiers of plant based medicines um, and how those those medical services, those plant services, ought to be used. Right. So with the the increasing language extinction that we're seeing in indigenous communities, both throughout Mexico and of course throughout the rest of the Americas, a lot of this knowledge is indeed being lost, but it has in a large part continued on um, uh, in part as preserved through these European pharmacopias that at this early stage of hubristic colonization, when the Europeans thought they could actually learn about all of this new material, it wasn't too much to know. They recorded a lot of it but that fell out of um, uh, uh, fashion by the time you get to the early uh, to mid 17th century and was only rediscovered or um, uh, re-encountered, studied anew by ethnobotanists in the early um, uh, 20th century. So that's where I think you see a lot of those studies of you know, assaying uh, uh, plants in the Florentine Codex for their medicinal potential. Um, so I think there's still work to be done. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Larry. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, I had a question more related to like, um, your plan planned release of um, this collection of data. I was wondering what type of keywords um, could be used to search such, such a database. Is it like, can I search just by plant families or like, yeah. compound classes? Well, thanks for asking that question. That's actually one of the things I wanted to get from you all today and in um, uh, uh, to kind of suss out. Um, 
as you see from my presentation, I'm really hesitant to draw definitive identifications from what I think is a fuzzy historical record. I'm, I'm, I think that some of these, these taxonomic designations of like the plants in the Florentine Codex are really bold. They presume that these naturalistic representations are like that the artist was pretty good and that you actually know the plant that you're looking at from these, may we say, less than completely detailed um, uh, manuscript renderings. On the other hand, like, I think that this knowledge is interesting because of course these plants still exist today in large part and, and we can kind of think through them as, as a source of natural products. So um, the, the database is based around um, these apothecary records. And um, so that is in fact what we are collecting. All of them are connected through a relational database of terms that have been transcribed out of those records. Each of those terms has been linked to a, um, a the, the Linnaean name of the plant, the Kew Gardens description in most of the botanical cases of distribution. And um, when it's possible, like for instance, in the, the Artemisia studies, right? Um, when the Artemisia is all over the pharmacopoeia in all different sorts of directions, some of the the chemical information that scholars who is not who are not me have suggested have been correlated to that material. So while I'm hesitant about doing that identificatory work myself, I think that plant family should be something that is built in to, if not the version that we release leading up to January, the version that will come out in the next year or so. Thank you, Amen. Uh, so I would just like to respond to, um, briefly to Dr. Grotewald's um, comment and also your follow-up, um, Dr. Cooley. I worked in, in Africa, South Africa principally, um, with ethnobotanists and traditional healers. And um, a, 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 a frequently related story is um, that the rector of the University of KwaZulu-Natal School of Medicine would when he returned to his um, village would first consult with the traditional healer of his village um, and then um, because they are highly respected individuals that know the the culture and the community um, and so this these traditions continue to this day that's so helpful to hear and um thank you so much for for sharing that and um uh, I I can um, I think that so my book I, the Treasury of Knowledge book I think is really going to center on this Hernandez story that I presented to you today, um, and much of the the work that I'm eager to do is uh, twofold. One, this collection of global pharmacopias is, is going to be some of the archival work, but learning more about the regard in which these traditional healers are held in today is I think critically important to understanding um, uh, the attempts that have been made to to integrate their knowledge into other systems and to um, preserve their knowledge. And so I really appreciate that anecdote. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. One is how much of the developed therapeutics could be traced back to Hernandez's work in Mexico? Yeah, um, a lot. A lot of the 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 um, uh, Mesoamerican corpus almost always runs through Hernandez. It also almost always touches on the Florentine Codex and the Codex Barianus, um, or the Libellus, um, uh, uh, which is uh, produced in fifteen fifty two. I'm seeing another one about uh, population size. Oh, that's interesting. How did popula uh, uh, um, uh, historical population size or rarity interact with the European desire or lack thereof for medical, uh, um, uh, for medical uses of different species? That's interesting. Thank you, uh, Gavin. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, I haven't correlated that, but I sure am after that question. Thank you. Um, That's very interesting. Um, I, I would be curious actually if um, for, in order to establish historical plant population size, 
where, I mean, I've still been using the, what we would consider uh, uh, anachronistic, right? Like Q botanical distributions or like other, uh, uh, um, uh, other kind of charts. I haven't seen um, a lot of historical plant mapping tools. So if anybody has suggestions about that, I would, I would be all ears. Um, I like that question a lot. Um, Kirana, um, ethnomedicine practitioner have been using the herbal extracts to cure disease. It would be the combined effects of the extracts, but nowadays scientists are majorly going with a search for single metabolites from plants. Yeah, that's really interesting. How do you think that we are, uh, do you think that we are really missing the right formulations um, by doing so to cure disease? Yes. So, um, uh, Karana, I think that that's a really powerful point. Um, much of well, the reason I'm so committed to global pharmacopias not being organized on the level of medicament, right? But not searching peyote in every single mention of pe peyote in the historical record is because these materials appear in assemblages, right? They're remedies of grouped materials, even though that, the, um, Ololiuki remedy that you're supposed to consume with uh, uh, chile and um, uh, whatever else, an amaze drink, right? Um, when thinking about these materials, we have to take into consideration that it was the trends in the scientific revolution that led to this um, focus on one particular element, the study of one element of nature, they would call it materia medica, out of term extracted without the other things with it with which it was mixed to make a remedy. So thinking about them as collective units, as assemblages that are, are um, deeply linked is I think key to seeing um, uh, the potential for these remedies. Um, and also, I mean, that of course includes some element of information about their preparation, which is of course kind of key to, to the, the success of the extract. Great. Uh, so let's thank uh, Dr. Cooley for, for this nice talk. And uh, it certainly helped me, helped change my perspective about when I read uh, descriptions of uses of plant plant based medicines or plant extracts. And, in papers, you know, coming from natural uh, sources, it helps. It gives me perspective on how to think about this. Even part dependency uh, exists in these descriptions. So thank you. Um, and if you can stay on for a couple of minutes, that would be good. I'll stop the recording. Uh, but thanks. Thank you so much for for your questions and for engaging with the, with this research.